Well, good morning. Uh, very good to be here. Even if Vicky did introduce me as punishment uh, for you, <laughs> uh, it may be punishment for me as well when you ask very difficult questions, uh, as was promised. Uh, it's very nice to be here. I've been to this um, school once before uh, with Ada uh, and, in fact, spent half my day on Friday uh, in London with um, the team who are creating a network of schools with a very similar inspiration to this across England called Studio Schools. Uh, and there are already quite a few open and another 12 opening in September. And we've been very inspired by what's being done uh, here. And it's almost identical in spirit. Um, I was asked to talk ab about homelessness and housing. And we'll just really share a couple of experiences which I hope are helpful for wh where you are having been thinking intensively now for, uh, for a day. One of the very striking things of every big city in the world is that it is a magnet. Big cities pull people in. People want to come to big cities and everywhere more people want to come to cities than there is space for them. In most big cities in the developing world, there are shanty towns all around. People make their own homes. Hong Kong and mainland China are almost unique in not having shanty towns, in fact, uh, and in having um, uh, public uh, housing more often. But if you look at the history of cities, homelessness is absolutely endemic uh, everywhere. And my experience of homelessness began uh, when I was a teenager and I volunteered, like many teenagers do, for a homelessness project where we made soup. Is this not working? It's just not on. It's just not on. Is this on? Is that on? Uh, yeah, it is. Oh, <laughs> uh, we made uh, soup and food for people staying in a hostel in a way which was almost identical to 100 years before, and it was good. Then, in my early 20s, I lived in a flat in London, on the top of a building, and I, as a single male, uh, had two rooms, and in the floor below me and the floor below, each of those two rooms had 20 Bangladeshis living in it, sharing the rooms. And what's interesting is um, none of them counted as homeless because the official statistics would not define them as homeless because they had a home. And the more you find out about homelessness, the more you realize it has many layers. Some are measured, some are not measured, definitions change, and there is always hidden homelessness, uh, couch homelessness, we call it in England, where people just sleep on someone else's couch when they lose their job or their home and so on. When I came into work in government in 1997, when Tony Blair was elected as Prime Minister, I was able to look at the issue not from the bottom up, but from the top down. And we had had quite a few years of very sharply widening inequality in the UK, worsening poverty, and homelessness had become the symbol of this. There was a famous moment when a minister complained that every weekend on his way to the opera, he had to step over homeless people in the streets. And uh, this tells you a lot about who ministers were, uh, <laughs> that this was their experience. But it became one of the symbolic issues which needed to be dealt with. And one of the things I did when I went into government was to create a new team in the government called the Social Exclusion Unit, which was meant to come up with better solutions to social problems and to get very quickly into implementation. And we worked on schooling and uh, neighborhood regeneration, issues like uh, drugs, but the question of street homelessness was almost the most urgent one. Not because the numbers were very big. In England, 
there were only about 2,000 people sleeping on the streets each night, even if there were maybe 200,000 people who were homeless by other definitions. But we were given the job of coming up with some solutions. So, if I can just walk over a little bit. The first thing we did, as in any... Um, this will disappear. Uh, any exercise of innovation or policy was diagnosis. What actually was the problem? What was going on with these people sleeping on the streets of London, Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow? And one of the things we did was talk to them. Uh, you could call it grandly ethnography, but it was really just conversation, uh, tracking people's lives. And we developed a very, very simple model my, my artistic capabilities are non-existent, as you can see. <laughs> uh, but what we, what we really looked at was the flows into homelessness, the life of being on the street, and then what was helping some people get out of homelessness and into a different kind of life. A life with a job, with a home, with relationships. And what we found was the system was broken. First of all, I don't know if you can guess where, where were people coming from, do you think, into, into, into street homelessness in the UK? Could you guess? A little bit, not very much. Broken families, quite often, yeah. Relationship breakdown. Immigrants, not so much. Most immigrants usually had someone else they could at least stay in the house with, like the 20 Bangladeshis under me. Mental, a lot of mental illness, yep. Yeah. Alcoholics. Alcoholics, yeah, a lot of alcohol problems. Any other? Gambling. gambling. Bit of gambling, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry? Soldiers, yeah. You've got almost all of the categories there. The one, other one is ex-prisoners. So in a way, the flows in came either from people who had been in what you could call total institutions. If you're in the army or if you're in prison, every aspect of your life is dealt with and organized, and then you leave them and you have nothing. So that was one category, and the other was mainly mental health, drugs, alcohol, and then often relationship breakdown. And those explain nearly all of the flows into homelessness. We then found that most of the organizations dealing with homelessness did nothing about any of the causes. They were very good, like the organization I volunteered for, at providing a bed. They were good at providing a bowl of soup. But if the cause was drugs or alcohol or mental health, they weren't addressing that at all. And we found very weak flows out of street homelessness, very few services providing a job or skills uh, or help with dealing with the causes. And so we had this bizarre situation. In London, there were 100 NGOs for 2,000 people on the streets all providing hostels, which dealt with the symptoms, but not with the causes. We had government, which had quite a lot of programs, in theory, about homelessness, but again, neither dealing with the causes, nor with the long-term solutions, in terms of skills, jobs, homes, etc. So, we um, attempted a different kind of policy. And it was very simple uh, in many ways, not particularly clever, but quite different from what government would normally do. And I'll just be very quickly describe what it was. So first of all, we tried to bring together all the budgets, all the public budgets, which were relevant to each part of this system. So the alcohol uh, treatment budget, the drugs treatment budget, the mental health 
care budget, as well as the funding for hostel places, as well as the funding for training and job support and housing provision, into a single pooled budget whose only task would be to get people out of street homelessness. We set a target. We loved targets in those days. And I dreamed up the target very scientifically. I, I made it up, um, which was to cut the numbers of people on the streets by two-thirds in three years. That was the target. And so we had money, we had a target, and then we created a team to implement it, and we tried to create something very unlike a traditional civil service team. It was called the Rough Sleepers Unit, and it was half made up of people from NGOs, some civil servants, some from business, but their only purpose was to achieve the outcome of cutting the numbers, and they were given great flexibility. They were expected to experiment, to adapt, to prototype, and not to follow a particular model. We introduced measurement, so we did a survey quite regularly of the numbers of people sleeping on the streets. So a team would literally go out on one night, maybe a Wednesday night or a Sunday night, and count the number of people on the streets. So we had an objective measure of success. And then these resources were then used for quite a range of different approaches, much more personalized, often trying to create was a plan for each individual, much more outreach going to where people were on the streets, and with a strong emphasis on helping people put together whatever they needed to put their life right. I say, which could be alcohol treatment, plus some training, plus a first hostel place, and then a, um, a, a room in an apartment, and as much as possible, then trying to integrate people back into uh, society. Now, the target was reached one year early, so we cut the numbers by two-thirds in two years, and um, then by 90% over about six years. The numbers are still down 90% compared to what they were, even though the population of London has gone up by one million during that period. So this was not rocket science. It was not particularly clever. It was doing some quite obvious things. Everybody knew this was how homelessness worked. But all the institutions, both the public sector ones and, in fact, the NGOs, acted as if they didn't know what the causes were and what the solutions were. Um, a few years later, four years later, New York copied almost exactly this model, uh, quite successfully, and uh, not quite as big a, a reduction, but achieved again a big reduction in homelessness. And in the US now, there is a big um, program underway to end veterans' homelessness. So army veterans in America are very likely to become homeless for the same reasons that they have had a They've been in the army, everything was provided for them, their food, their health, their every minute of their day. You've all seen the films. And then they leave the army and there's nothing. Uh, and often they also have drugs problems in the army. So they are about to institute across the USA a big program, I think a bit similar to this, or at least they're trying to make it similar to this, because President Obama has committed to ending all veterans' homelessness by the middle of the um, decade. Um, and within this, I should say, in a way, all we tried to do in the UK was not create the answers to street homelessness, but to create a, a space, including uh, budgets and structures, within which people could then innovate much more fine-grained solutions. Because the sort of solutions which will work for a 
you know, a 53-year-old alcoholic who has not had a job for 20 years um, uh, and who was perhaps in the army 20 years ago, that will be very different from a 23-year-old with uh, schizophrenia uh, from maybe a middle-class family in the southeast. And what you needed was the space to be much more precise, much more um, attuned to the individual uh, needs uh, and experience. Um, as I said before, the thing about homelessness is usually in almost every place, homelessness is the difference between inflows and outflows. So that was true of people sleeping on the streets. The numbers on the streets was just the difference between the numbers coming to sleep on the streets and the numbers who were going off the streets. But the same is true of homelessness in Hong Kong, or homelessness in Lagos, or homelessness in Sao Paulo. And so always it's very important not just to look at homelessness as a static phenomenon, but always to look at the flows. How do you perhaps reduce the flows in? How do you increase the flows out? And yet most immediate responses to homelessness deal with symptoms, not with causes. So my, my main suggestion to you on Sunday morning is in everything you do, uh, look at both. If you don't deal with a symptom, you can't in fact deal with the causes. So it's very important that people do have somewhere to live. They do have shelter. They do have a uh, home. And in the US, there's a movement called Housing First, which says first you provide someone with housing, and then you provide the other things. Because otherwise, where do you start? But it's very important you don't have housing last. That is not, that's, not, that's the beginning of the story, not the end of it. And um, so I hope in all your creativity, uh, as much goes here and here as here. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, can I invite you to sit uh, on this nice, comfortable green chair with me? Uh, <laughs> as Jeff uh, may know, I've wanted to be a TV show host for some time. You saw it yesterday. We're going to do it again today. Um, thank you so much, Jeff, for giving us those insights. Uh, I think that's lo lots of the things that Jeff was saying about creating the space, bringing people together, the way we're collaborating, um, the adapting and the adopting of models uh, across the seas is something that we definitely touched on yesterday. But hopefully that was a helpful reflection for you all to, um, to hear it from someone that's actually done it. Um, before I give you all the opportunity to ask Jeff a question, um, and I hear we have some questions also from Facebook and some other social media things that I don't know about. Um, before we do that, can I ask you a question, please, Jeff? Um, <laughs> it's a really easy one. So clearly uh, what Jeff just described, um, not only by the innovativeness of the method, but also by the figures and the numbers, um, really made a difference but what's the one thing that you wish you'd done or you'd had time to do in government in terms of dealing with the issue of housing and homelessness that you didn't have the opportunity to do well our, our, our big mistake and this applied to all of our social policies was we still were thinking in terms of policy solutions here is a problem our job was to design a solution and then you tick the box when it's succeeded. And in some ways, I think we were quite good and progressive. We brought in civil society to shaping the policy. We brought in homeless people then to report to cabinet committees on whether it was being achieved. But we didn't run this as an innovation program. And in retrospect, what we should have done, and this applied to all of our social policies, was to have set aside more overtly a share of the budget for funding more experimental approaches. And we should have been more patient. When, I, when I, I left government in the UK, I said the big mistake of government is it overestimates how much it can achieve short-term 
and underestimates how much it can achieve long term. And we were in a hurry. So everything was done very fast with a target. But in fact, if we thought of this as a 10-year program, not a two-year program, we would have built in much more space for trials, experiments, pilots, uh, to improve the bits which were still weren't working very well. And in a way, that's why I moved from being a top-down policy maker to being a social innovation enthusiast. Because in the long run, you have to embed innovation into these sort of processes. Otherwise, they, they run out of steam. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, who else has a question for Jeff? I actually just don't believe that. <laughs> There's one. Could you say what your name is as well and where you're from, just so Jeff knows who you are, please? Thank you. I'm Jacob from TEDx Taipei, and I want to ask that, well, do you have the next steps you want to achieve? What's the next step for your programs or your organization? Can you tell us? For, for the organization where I, I work? Yeah. Or? yeah, what's your next, ne next goal? Do you have one? What's your life plan, Jeff? My life plan. Yeah. <laughs> Other, other than featuring on my TV show. Um, well, I, 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 I used to work with Louise and Vicky at the Young Foundation, and then uh, nearly a year ago went to run an organization called Nesta, which was a public foundation. And uh, Sorry, which was a, is a public foundation, and my first task was to move it out of the public sector. So we have an endowment of money, and I wanted to rejoin civil society. And we managed to persuade the government to let us leave government with the money. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we, we, we did that in April. So now we are trying to really reinvent ourselves as a, a, a foundation, an endowment, which covers the full range from quite commercial activity in technology. We invest in startups, early stage commercial companies, through innovation programs in the health service, in municipalities, uh, a lot in civil society, uh, all the way through to research and projects in the arts. So my, my, my work project, maybe my, my life project, is how do we use that freedom? How can we use that freedom to greatest impact? We've got a lot of freedom, but it's always a risk if you have freedom that you waste it. So i am come to things like this partly to help me think through how we can do our job better. Do you have any suggestions for Jeff about how he can do this better? Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> That's for everyone as well, if anyone has any ideas. Hi. Can you say who you are and where you're from as well, please? It's right there. Put your hand up again. Um, I'm Vincent. Um, I'd like to ask you about um, the, the circle, like how you operated the circle of the board. Um, as you said, um, when you restructured the circle, you actually like, um, you made sure there was budget, there was money, and you made sure that there was a team of NGOs and maybe business people and also civil servants. And you said there was a structure. But I think innovation is more than these three elements, right? There must be other things that help to bring out the innovation um, when you try to move the circle to achieve the goals. So what other elements did you put inside the circle apart from money and structure which actually helped with um, promoting or inspiring the innovation that um, did, let's, um, eventually solve the problem in two years? Well, you've, you've spotted the flaw in my whole approach, <laughs> which is a good thing to have done, uh, because in a, way, in a way this is the, the key. We were thinking of this as a, uh, like a government thinks, which is problem, structure, solution, and so on. And as I was saying a bit earlier, in practice what we should have done is, yes, had a pooled budget, uh, had a, um, a, say, a, a unit and a team to solve things, but we also should have much more systematically supported competing approaches and different approaches. We should have had a separate approach for, let's say, helping the army to take responsibility for people leaving the army 
to stop being homeless. We should have allowed more experimentation around better models of um, drug treatment for homeless people. We should have uh, perhaps um, had a, a prize or opened up experimentation in what worked with job placements for homeless people or persuading big companies to take on homeless people and give them jobs. We did it in much too centralized a way. Um, and in retrospect, we should have had half very centralized, target-driven, but half much more exploratory, much more innovation-oriented. And um, I think the other thing that would have achieved was more, um, uh, more ownership of the solutions over time. Whereas the problem of you ever do anything top down from a government, you own the solutions, you may be, take credit if you achieve them, but everyone else feels a bit passive, like they're recipients. And these were big mistakes, which you spotted. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Anyone else? Yeah, uh, my name is Phyllis, and I'm from Guangzhou, but currently studying in Hong Kong. So, uh, two questions for you. The first is, uh, you just mentioned that actually you don't have a targeted plan for a different kind of people who are going into homelessness. There is also not a, a job pl placement or other program to support and to get out of circle. So, could you please explain a little bit more what does the government actually do to make it so effective that you actually reduce 90% of homelessness. Yes. Um, and the second question is, um, do you believe that without uh, sufficient government support, we're still able to achieve such things? And is there a possibility in that? Well, in, in the UK context, <laughs> government had to be very much part of the solution. It, it had m most of the power and most of the money. Um, maybe let me mention two or three specific elements which help to make this work. So prisons is a good example. Lots of people leave prison and become homeless, and some quite simple changes to how prisoners were released could have quite a big impact. So in some cases, ensuring prisoners already had a home to move into. In Britain, most prisoners would leave with no money and no home. And not surprisingly, the first thing they did, well, on day two or three out of prison, was to commit a crime to get some money <laughs> to get a house. <laughs> so it was a very stupid uh, policy. And we've tried moving to commissioning prison services so they will be rewarded for how long people stay out of prison after leaving prison rather than just paying to provide prison places. And there's a whole set of new financing tools to, to do that. On, on the, jo the job side, there's a sort of policy set of answers where you maybe provide a cash subsidy for employers to take someone who has been street homeless... But I think there's also a moral dimension, which is persuading big employers that they have a moral obligation to provide job opportunities for homeless people. And at various times there have been campaigns to get big employers to commit and get the leading employers then to commit other employers to, to, to doing so. So un underneath this sort of framework is in fact a lot of different kinds of detail which are needed to deal with the, the complexities of the causes. And I'm sure the same will be true uh, anywhere. I don't know if that answers part of your question. Yeah. Okay, we have one final question. Oyin. Very quick. Hi, my name is Oyin. I was working with homeless people in London last year. And... Yeah, uh, you're talking about like, very much precise targeting, target 
to resolve problem. But what I also experienced is that because there are lots of services toward homeless people already, but it is very targeted, and once people ap approach to the service to get some help, often people found that he's not eligible to get such a service because he's not targeted in terms of law, in terms of policy, in terms of any other regulations, and people are very uh, frustrated because why I'm not targeted as a, from the user's perspective. How do you think about this uh, uh, frustration from the people? Well, this whole story began in about 1997, 98. I think worked quite well for about five years and achieved its targets, but then lost all momentum. And, uh, and in a way, as always happens, if you don't have momentum, slipped back. So, for example, there was a principle which tried to be applied, which is probably talked about here, no wrong door. Do you have a no wrong door principle? Some of you do. That's to say, wh wherever you show your problem, as it were, it may be to a, uh, a, a part of the state, social security, or a drug treatment, or a charity, that wherever you appear they should be able to deal with the totality of your needs and connect to the other services which you may need, even if it's not what they provide. It's a very simple principle, clearly important for groups like street sleepers who will have multiple problems, usually. Maybe gambling debt, maybe drugs, maybe family. I could not pretend that had been dealt with in, in England, partly because each of the agencies was in fact unwilling to do it. Even the, most, the best intentioned organizations didn't really like the principle of no wrong door because often it means um, passing a client to someone else and then you don't get paid for doing something for them. And I think NGOs are as bad on this as public organizations. And so I would, just, I would use your, your challenge, which is a very good challenge, but I think it applies in every system. If you really reshaped it from the user perspective, the user experience, and always the user experience, the homeless person's experience, will be that the systems and structures providing things are baffling, complicated, multiple. And how do you turn that into simplicity and clarity and usefulness. This is really hard. And yet I think it's one of the things where government can play a role in sort of forcing people to collaborate and cooperate. But I would criticize governments that they don't sufficiently use their power to, as it were, standardize, even centralize where it's useful, but they usually centralize the wrong things where it's not useful. So perhaps the innovation question is, how do you have lots of diversity, a thousand flowers blooming, but also have sufficient simplicity and clarity that if you are a homeless person, perhaps with a mental health problem, perhaps not very literate, that you can still navigate your way through these thousand flowers. So I'm not answering your question, but I'm turning it into a slightly different question. Thanks, Jeff. Now, one, we have 30 seconds left, um, and this is a... <laughs> you have posed many innovation questions to this group of people, um, and yesterday they, they posed their own, and this is partly your punishment, um, and, and, and also with the premise that no, no idea is a bad idea, obviously. Um, so yesterday we um, did a very amusing, I think, ideation exercise in the afternoon, and the groups all swapped tables and we gave them a series of um, very difficult things to answer to come up with many ideas. And we did. We probably came up with seven or 800 ideas between the group of how to solve homelessness or housing problems in Hong Kong. Now, given you weren't here yesterday and you don't know any of the context, um, one of the questions we asked this group, um, and it was very hard, was what would you do if you only had $100 to solve homelessness in Hong Kong. 
Uh, I'm not going to ask you that. But the other question that I did ask, we did ask them was, what would you do if you had all the money in the world and no, no problems from government and from officials? If you had all the freedom and all the money in the world, what would you do to solve homelessness in Hong Kong? And they actually came up with some really nice ideas. So rather than giving us an innovation question, Jeff, could you give us uh, your response to what you would do if you had no barriers and all the money in the world to solve homelessness in, and housing problems in Hong Kong? Please. Oh, my God. Oh, and you've, <laughs> you've got about 20 seconds. No idea is a bad idea. No one will judge you. In a way, in a way, it's quite easy. Uh, it's um, no. I mean, in, in in Hong Kong, perhaps differently from London, the simplest thing to do is you build lots of houses. And uh, we in the UK are about to copy Hong Kong in building a new airport on an island out to sea. So, if money was no object, you create more land, you build more housing. Um, what kind of housing? But, but that probably solves problems for, uh, in the short term. And then even more people want to come to Hong Kong as a result. <laughs> so you have more problems later down the line. So, yeah, I'm not answering your question at all. Okay, Sorry. that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, let's just give Jeff a quick round of applause and say thank you for sharing your insights. <laughs>